Hi guys. Well, as the shirt says, the end is near or the end is here. We are heading into our final chapter of Peruvian Plunge, chapter 28. Adonde vas? Where are you going? Should have been the question I asked myself when I left Austin, Texas. Um, but anyway, before we start chapter 28, is, is it happened one, two, or three times that the last minute of one of my readings, the camera shut down, so we need to do the last minute of chapter 27 in New Eden, Peru, and then we will start the road back to Cusco. So to pick up where we so unceremoniously left off. <clears throat> Not wanting to get into a debate on the merits of reforestation with a woman who spoke no English while sitting behind a chainsaw the size of a small locomotive, I changed the subject to the new road from Itawania. I asked her if she thought the new road and its attendant truck traffic, boat traffic, an influx of new settlers would be a good thing or a bad thing for New Eden. Es muy bueno, she assured me, flashing me a toothless smile. <coughs> she swept her leathery hand across the view over the soccer field, pointing out where all the new houses and stores, maybe even a restaurant and a hotel, will soon be sprouting just as soon as the bulldozers arrive which she assured me would be in less than a year. The future was so bright in New Eden that she had to wear shades. I thought of the existential abyss known as Itawania and mentioned to her that New Eden would soon look like that when the bulldozers then the trucks arrived. As far as she was concerned, that day could not come a moment too soon. I thanked the kind woman for her hospitality, crossed the sun-blistered soccer field and the ruined derelict bridge, passed through the listless banana trees, and re-entered the cool leafy greenery of the primary forest. A flock of blue and gold macaws flew overhead, squawking in their endless chatter. A giant blue morpho butterfly, the only traffic on the future highway that day, almost crashed into me in its drunken flight on oversized wings. I paused for a while under the magnificent crown of the giant kapok tree, just soaking in its energy. I couldn't pause for long, though. I needed to get back to my little jungle hideout and pack up my stuff before darkness rolled into the forest. It was back to the bungalow for me for a meal and a cold shower. Tomorrow, I would be climbing into a fancy tour boat with seven eco-tourists at the crack of dawn for a comfortable ride back to Shintoya. And this brings us into chapter 28, A Donde Vas? And we're going to start with a quote from Chico Mendez. They got me! The last three words ever, by, ever spoken by Chico Mendez in 1988 when he was gunned down in cold blood by the Planet Eaters in his own home. And this brings us up to Wednesday July 29th, 2009, <clears throat> waking up in New Eden. The rooster from hell and I both were up well before the sun. I loaded up my bag of cannonballs and stopped by the kitchen just long enough to pour myself a hot cup of coffee from the gas stove. Thanks again, Hunt Oil! Before heading to the rocky beach to enjoy a spectacular sunrise, over the mother of God. There could be worse things in life than owning a piece of this river, the old gringo real estate investor inside of me decided, 
as the distant line of clouds over the mountains of Manu ignited into rosy flames and the water birds headed out for the day's fishing. The motley crew of Danish eco-tourists began their penguin-like march over the rocky beach and into the comfortable tour boat. I waited patiently for them to settle into their soft padded seats before taking my place at the very head of the boat, the windiest spot, but always my favorite. Once everyone was wrapped in their life jackets, which were of course non-existent on the cargo boat I came in on, we set off into the gorgeous morning for a two-hour trip to Shenpuya. Other than a few tense minutes when it appeared we weren't going to make it through a particularly rocky shoal, the trip went off without a hitch, a rare occurrence in the Peruvian Amazon, you can be sure. It was a truly spectacular morning on the Mother of God River in every respect as we motored upstream against the current in our comfortable boat. I was trying my hardest to ignore the swaths of open sunlight just behind the curtain of old growth trees along the riverbank, indicating where the jungle had already fallen. But it was tough. Just before Itawania, I spied one of the grandest specimens of Gaian creation I had ever seen, not 50 feet away from it. The chainsaws had laid waste to a stretch of riverbank right down to the water's edge. Whether the lumberjacks had left this flat-topped behemoth out of respect for its majesty, yeah right, or simply because they'd run out of gas in their chainsaw, was unclear. Every time we would pass a bird or a monkey, the guide would point it out to the camera-toting tourist. Our most exciting find that morning was a flock of white and black keen vultures feasting on the carcass of a capybara. Every time we would pass a logging boat or truck, or the whole sad town of Itawania for that matter, the guy would just sit there, quiet as a statue. As far as I could tell, not one other tourist on the boat had any clue what was going on right around them, just as I had been deceived on my first trip down that same stretch of river. Or, if they did, they could care less, <clears throat> despite the sinister shenanigans of the planet eaters going on all around me, it was so beautiful along the Mother of God that I was sorry to see Shintuya appear around the bend, back to the real world of buses. Just as I had found a boat ready to depart Shintuya for Nueva Eden when I had arrived from the other direction six days earlier, I was thrilled to find two half-empty buses pointed towards Salvacion, ready to head off in the next 15 minutes. I would be back at the Shela by 11 a.m. <clears throat> if I felt like it, as it was a Wednesday and buses were heading west that day, I could go all the way back into Cusco that very day. Even in the Peruvian Amazon, there are days when things run smoothly. There was just one little catch. There always is in the Peruvian Amazon. <clears throat> My overflow bag of cannonballs was in Ramon's house about five minutes up the hill from the bus stop. Of course, my other full bag of cannonballs was back at the Shela in Salvacion. How many times would I go through this same movie before I learned whatever lesson Spirit was trying to teach me? I assured the bus captain I would be back within 15 minutes and told him I would meet him at the top of the hill in front of the ramen noodle store. Not wanting to risk leaving my full bag of cannonballs unattended in the unguarded bus, I struggled up the hill under its oppressive weight to Ramon's house to find the house shut up tight with a padlock on the door. Shit! 
I had 10 minutes to make a critical decision. Either wait for Ramon to come back from wherever he was, and for all I knew, he was in Puerto Maldonado or Cusco for a week. Or to say, screw it, and let Ramon keep the lousy bag of overflow cannonballs. If you added up the value of everything in that bag, including the bag, it would probably come up to about 20 bucks. The problem was, I was sentimentally attached to the damn bag. An old U.S. Army rucksack that I had had for 20 years and had been with me through all sorts of Hambo Madcap adventures. And inside the bag were my favorite pair of Guatemalan pants, which I could not replace outside of Guatemala. If I waited it out and missed the bus, on the other hand, I would have to spend another night at the Shintuya Lodge, three times the price of the Shela. I would have nothing to eat except ramen noodles, and I would be kissing goodbye any chance of getting back to Cusco until at least Friday night as the buses did not run in that direction on Thursday. It was, in other words, a classic ham-bone Peruvian Amazon dilemma and one I needed to figure out PDQ. While I was standing there in Ramon's dusty backyard cussing up a gringo blue streak and trying to figure out a way to burglarize the dude's house to retrieve my 20 bucks worth of worthless shit, the universe made up my mind for me. A block off in the distance, I heard the two buses beginning their leapfrog race for passengers back to Salvacion. It would be 24 hours before the next bus, and there were no boats going upstream at all. I sat down on my bag of cannonballs in the dusty backyard and, ha and had what can only be described as a miniature nervous breakdown as the most severe attack of what the fuck are you doing with your life depression of my entire trip rolled over me. I don't know how long I sat there sinking into my own little existential despair of being stuck in fucking Shintuya for one day when all around me were the hovels of 200 folks who would be stuck in this shithole for the rest of their lives. For them, the bus to salvation would have to wait for the next turn of the cosmic screw. <clears throat> It was to one of those desperate hovels that I retreated to next to stash, you guessed it, my full bag of cannonballs while I set off in search of Ramon, the nice and gorgeous woman stirring a pot of what appeared to be mashed up roadkill over a smoky fire told me that Ramon was at work and would be back at around 5 p.m., it was now 9 a.m. Well, at least he was somewhere in town. I figured I would go get the key from him, retrieve my overflow bag of cannonballs from his house, and hitchhike yet again in the back of a logging truck to Salvacion. If I hadn't found a ride by 2 p.m., I would have the fallback of spending the night in the lodge. Not a perfect plan, but it sure beats sitting in Ramon's depressing backyard for eight fucking hours. I asked Ramon's next-door neighbor where Ramon worked. She answered in one of those long, compli complicated barrage, barrages of Spanish that may as well have been in Greek. I told her I would pay her a dollar, probably a day's wages in her case, if she would lead me to Ramon's job site. She gave me one of those exasperated, it's a toy boat gringo looks, and led me to the top of a small rise just above Ramon's house. She pointed to the northwest toward Manu National Park. For a moment, I thought she was telling me that Ramon, a popular tour guide, was leading some tourists on a day trip in the park. No, no, she said, tapping her ear and telling me to listen. 
I followed her vague instructions, but all I could hear was Gideon's trumpet, those fucking chainsaws in the logging operation in the jungle on the other side of the Mother of God. What could that have to do with Ramon? Then the sick realization penetrated my thick skull. No, not Ramon. Not the long-haired poster child of the noble savage fantasy, the ayahuasca quaffing son of a son of a shaman, tour guide for the tree huggers, and Shintuya's most ardent critic of the planet eaters from Hunt Oil Comedy. I would believe Moose Mulligan joining the Wilderness Society before I would let myself believe that Ramon, my San Pedro guide into the Stone Age, would take a job murdering old-growth rainforest trees. Trying to convince myself that I misunderstood, I turned to the woman and pantomimed sawing down a tree with a chainsaw. Si, sí, senor, she said. Ramon es maderero. Ramon is a logger. Any faint lingering enigma of noble savage fantasy I had left in my naive tree-hugging brain flew out the window forever at that moment, never to return again. I don't care how much San Pedro or ayahuasca I drink or how many photos of penis-sheathed, feather-masked Indians I see again. If Ramon would sell his soul to the planet-eating devil so he could afford whatever fucking plastic bauble or house addition or whatever the hell it was he felt was so missing in his life than anybody would. Even given the guy the benefit of the doubt, which I still do, that logging old-growth rainforest is a last resort option to make money because men from his village feel correctly that there are no other options. The fact that he had considered it an option at all on any level knocked the wind out of me. My mind swirling with the enormity of this news, I followed the woman back to her shack to retrieve my bag of cannonballs. I lugged, my, I lugged my luggage back up the hill to Ramon's place and collapsed into a filthy little plastic lawn chair, one of those tacky little stackable plastic pieces of shit they sell at Walmart for three bucks. What the hell had happened to this beautiful day? And it was a gorgeous day in the Amazon jungle since I'd gotten out of my comfortable padded seat in the tourist boat less than an hour before. How the hell had I, had I managed to go from that to this? Conveniently ignoring the fact that I was surrounded by an entire village of folks who would have given their right arm to trade places with me in life, I abandoned myself to a fit of self-pity, desperate for words of wisdom and, ad and advice in this dark moment of my soul, I turned to the closest thing I have to a Bible, Becoming, the third book in the Handbook for the New Paradigm. I opened the little book to the passage where I had left off last and read the following words. When each individual being, when each individual being incarnates on this planet, it is with the intention of blessing all experience into wisdom, not only for themselves, but for the planetary whole. I closed the book and reflected on those words about blessing all experience into wisdom. Where was the fucking wisdom in this experience? Sitting alone in a tacky little plastic chair in the hellhole of Shintuya, Peru, 
half-starved and bug-bit at 9 a.m., sidelined, waiting eight hours for an Amazon native ayahuasca shaman to finish his day job murdering trees so I could get the key to rescue a beat-up old U.S. Army rucksack with a couple of changes of old clothes inside it. To answer your first question, Spirit said condescendingly from my left shoulder, the wisdom in this experience for yourself is that obviously you still have too much baggage in your life and you need to let more of it go. Fuck you, I said, flipping Spirit off. I've let go of more shit in the past six months than most of the people I know will ever dream of letting go. <clears throat> Let other people wor worry about their own baggage. You just worry about yours, dude, she responded. Now, as far as the second part of the equation is concerned, what this experience you are having means to the wisdom of the planetary whole you're a big boy. You know as well as I do what the message to this planet is. You don't need me to translate it for you. Of course, Spirit was right again. The message was as clear to me as it was to her, but, and I don't mean to insult your intelligence this far into Peruvian Plunge, if you still haven't figured out what the message is, let me spell it out for you right here. If, as a society and as a species, we have sunk so low, so rolling in the pig shit low, that we have our shamans massacring in cold blood with chainsaws, perhaps the most glorious creation in Gaia's four billion year long history, on the banks of the Mother of God River, no less, we need to fucking wake up, people, and take a long, hard look at what we are doing to ourselves and to this planet, our mother, and turn this runaway train of greed and madness back around. Otherwise, we deserve every damn bit of the karma we have coming our way, and coming our way soon, wise old chicken little speaking from the voice of blessed experience just doesn't know how to say it any plainer than that, guys. <clears throat> so I just sat there in that little plastic lawn chair, symbol of where our brains are as a society, if ever there was one, and cogitated on the state of the planet and the state of my bag of cannonballs until a roving flock of half-starved chickens began pecking the dust around my feet and roused me from my funk. Watching the sad-looking hungry birds, it suddenly dawned on me that I, too, was damn hungry. I stashed my bag of cannonballs in Ramon's crapper, probably the only one in Shintuya outside of the mission that both flushed and had a seat, and walked over to the native village's only store to load up on such native Amazonian delicacies as saltine crackers, Oreos, ramen noodles, and Coke. My diet for the next 26 hours, and as far as I could tell, most Shintoyans' diet for the next 26 years, I returned back to my lonely, self-imposed siege where the crinkling plastic wrapper of my cracker and Oreo lunch soon had half the population of Shintoya's open-range chicken flock pecking at crumbs falling around my feet. With nothing else <clears throat> to fill my life for the next seven hours, I opened up my little Mickey Mouse spiral-bound notebook and dove into chapter 25 of this saga, the story of my meeting and subsequent friendship with planet eater extraordinaire Moose Mulligan. The more I got into it, the deeper I sunk into that parallel universe that only chroniclers of the downfall of Western civilization can feel when the words just seem to write themselves. 
I was so into it that I barely noticed and was almost disappointed on one level when Ramon dragged his exhausted, sweaty ass home. I noticed his posture wasn't quite as erect and proud as it was when he was talking about ayahuasca or kicking Hunt Oil's ass. I felt somehow embarrassed to be standing there, and I felt that he shared my feelings. We mumbled brief greetings, and he stepped inside to get my bag of overflow cannonballs. He asked me what I was thinking about my trip to Amana, the sacred rock in Amarakari that I had almost forgotten about, and I tossed off some gringo excuse, not entirely a lie, that my money was running short and I would have to get to the bank in Cusco before I could be hiring him or any other guide. I left out the small detail that my article about Hunt Oil would be coming out in four days and I didn't want to be anywhere near Salvacion when that shit hit the fan. I told him I would see him sometime down the line. We shook hands and I headed off with both my bags of cannonballs toward the expensive lodge where I was supposed to have someone waiting for me with the key if things were working the way they should be in Shintoya. Unbelievably, things were working the way they should be in Shintoya. There wasn't one person, but three young 20-something harem boot native women waiting at the lodge when I arrived at twilight. As I cooked and then ate my delicious meal of two packs of ramen noodles, I engaged the young women in conversation. The subject of our little 20-minute chat was, you guessed it, hunt oil. Once I had carefully finagled from them the information that they were all opposed to hunt coming into their village, I moved the conversation a little farther northward. I asked them if they had ever heard of Camasea, the huge natural gas development just the other side of Manu National Park that had wreaked such havoc on the environment, not to mention the health of the locals. I was met with three blank stares. I may as well have been talking about Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. Surely you have heard of Bagua, I said. You know where all those natives were just murdered by the government for messing with the oil companies, I said in Spanglish, almost desperately. One of the three women seemed to have some vague spark of recognition in her eye about some place called Bagua, but she knew no details. Her friends were completely clueless to what I was talking about. I paid the young women for my room, which is what they were there for anyway, and they disappeared down the dark road, leaving me alone with my thoughts in the empty lodge. I loaded a bowl, poured a stiff drink, and opened my last pack of Oreos. The sheer tragedy of Shintuya, Peru was more than I could deal with. It was already a logged out wasteland on this side of the river, and Ramon and his buddies were laying waste to the other side. In another couple of years, Shintuya would be the next Kamasea. How long, I wondered, would it take to become the next Bagua? brings us to Thursday, July 30th, 2009. Sometime during the night, yet another monsoon had swept through the Mother of God, and I awoke to a soggy gray dawn with intermittent spits of rain. While waiting for the little blue bus, this was a one-bus day to Salvacion, a nice car with rolled-up tinted windows pulled up beside me. When the passenger side window rolled down on its smooth electric motor, it was none other than Moose Mulligan himself smiling out at me. He was on an early morning recon mission to God and Planet Eaters only know where, stuffed in a car with five of his colleagues. 
He laughed when he saw me standing forlornly on the side of the road, umbrella in hand, and two bags of cannonballs stacked beside me. He would love to give me a lift, he said, but there was simply no room left in the comfortable car. See you back at the ranch, Samwell, he laughed. The tinted window rolled up silently, and the group of planet eaters disappeared down the road. Thirty minutes later, as the rain was picking up speed, the goddamn bus still hadn't come. I hoisted my bag of cannonballs to my back and trudged the half mile to the bus stop in downtown Shintuya. At least the walk gave me the opportunity to stop by the little store and load up on a healthy breakfast of Oreos and Coke. The friendly bus captain, who was in no hurry to get moving, as he did not have to compete against the big green bus for fares that day, finally sauntered up to his bus and we rolled out of Shintuya on a drizzly Thursday morning, Salvacion bound once again. Arriving at the Shela three hours later, I was none too pleased and none too surprised to discover that the swelling tide of planet eaters from Hunt Oil, oops, make that South American explorations had taken over every single room at the only decent hotel in town, <clears throat> leaving no space for anyone else, Peruvian or gringo alike, to get a decent room in salvation for at least the next four months. The kindly and rich hotel manager referred me to her competition down the street, a rambling two-story wood frame hovel that made the Hotel Moderno and Puerto Maldonado look positively moderno in comparison. What the hell? It was only for one night, and it's not like I had a whole lot of other options. I returned to the Shayla one last time to collect my other bag of cannonballs that I had moved over from the Manu Learning Center the week before and piled the whole sloppy mess into the corner of my room. I passed the rainy day at the internet cafe catching up on the dozens of emails that had poured in from the real world while I had been hiding out in the jungle. That night, Moose and I enjoyed our last dinner and 110 gallons of cerveza together. Three sheets to the wind, I stumbled home to the Hotel Mierda and collapsed into the head lice nest that was supposed to pass for a bed. I was just drifting off to sleep when not one, not two, not three, but four four roosters from hell got into a screaming match right outside my glassless window. In a desperate rage, I glanced at my alarm clock. It was three minutes past midnight. And you know, guys, I think for old time's sake, we're going to break it here and finish up with our final trip from Salvation to Cusco, coming right up 